Our next panel is entitled Energy's New Prize. The old prize, according to Daniel Jurgen, was oil, wealth, and power. Now, global warming has changed the game. Our speakers are Jose Ignacio Sanchez Galan, Chairman and CEO of Iberdrola, Ernest Moniz, the 13th U.S. Secretary of Energy and founder of Energy Futures Initiative, and Josephine Wapakabulo, founder and managing director, TIG Africa. The moderator is once again the amazing Alex Steele, anchor of Bloomberg Television. Welcome, everybody. It is so great to be here. Uh, thank you for my panelists uh, for being here as well. We're very much looking forward uh, to this, talking about the future of energy. We do have a poll that I just want to point out now because we can address it sooner rather than later in the session. Uh, the poll is, what is the future of oil? A uh, couple options. You got demand is going to come roaring back after the pandemic. Oil producers are doomed. Uh, government action on climate will just decimate demand. Carbon capture and storage technology will allow the world to keep guzzling oil, or ultimately, renewables will replace oil. This will help us set the stage for the discussion, so feel free to enter your response to the poll as soon as you can. Let's pick up right where I left off with Mr. Carney. And to that point, Mr. Secretary, let me start with you. We do have a new presidency uh, that will take office uh, in January. What is the role of the U.S. in public policy? What do we need to see out of a Biden administration to get the ball rolling faster here in the U.S.? Well, of course, uh, President Biden, uh, as, he's, as he has said, will rejoin Paris on day one. Uh, but I think we all know and, and he knows uh, that that's an important step. But frankly, to establish or reestablish uh, Amer some, some role, some American leadership role, uh, we're going to have to take care of, uh, of business at home. Uh, so I, I expect that, uh, first of all, the, uh, the president will come out of the box with a strong set of executive actions. Uh, those will range from uh, going back to the future, like with CAFE standards. Uh, it will be rollbacks of the Environmental Protection Agency actions of the last few years. For example, getting back to uh, greatly lowering methane emissions. And there will be advances. Um, uh, for example, uh, the issue of the financial regulatory agencies, I think, will be uh, will be a big deal. Uh, the uh, the CFTC, Commodities Futures Trading Commission, uh, published a, a milestone report uh, where uh, we will see climate risks uh, as internalized by those agencies uh, as uh, something that corporations uh, will need to do. Also, the Federal Regulatory Commission will. Uh, I think, uh, really look at market reform to accommodate the new technologies. Uh, clearly, there will be some areas where Congress has to be engaged, but even there, no matter how Georgia turns out, I think we will see a big bipartisan push on innovation uh, in this decade, and we'll see a big push on, on energy infrastructure, uh, because that can cannot be kicked down the road uh, anymore. Uh, how it gets paid for is something, maybe a stimulus package, uh, but I think that there will be an, an aggressive, uh, aggressive program. More legislation. Well, we'll see how it, how it turns out in Georgia. I mean, in some ways, you know, the U.S. is far behind uh, Europe, for example. And Ignacio, I thought that's where you could help us with this, because not only did you have the U.K. with a 12 billion uh, pound green plan just announced today from everything from hydrogen to wind to EVs, uh, nuclear, you name it, uh, Germany extending subsidies uh, for EVs. I mean, the push is real on a monetary level and a regulatory level and a government level in Europe. How has that informed your decision, your capital allocation? So uh, I think it's uh, uh, the, the, uh, I'm always an optimistic person, and I think this uh, COVID crisis is a great opportunity, as uh, my, my, my good friend Ernest is already mentioning, for changing things. So uh, uh, I, I think in, the, in this particular moment, the world uh, requires already more investment. The world requires requir already to increase uh, the number of jobs, the creation of, of jobs. Uh, because the only way to live from a crisis is with more investment, and with more activity, and with more jobs, and with more efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. We have the opportunity of changing many things in the, in the, in the energy sector. So uh, I, I think in, in this moment, uh, I think the winds, uh, we've been for 20 years already uh, uh, trying to change this one, and uh, they, we are not very well understood what we are doing. Now, fortunately, most of the countries 
recognized and they are already away how we can decarbonize the economy at the same time that we can become more efficient. But they require investment and they require already a, 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 a political and regulatory framework would make that happen. I think in Iberdrola, what we have already last present in the United States, we are already present in 25 states. Mm -hmm. We are already asking for more than $30 billion. And uh, 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 we are already just presented uh, two weeks ago our long term plan up to 2025 with an investor investment which amounts are close to $90 billion. To, for what? First, even if we are the leaders in renewables worldwide in wind, I think to, we plan to double this, to reach 60,000 megawatts of renewables, to increase our investment in, in, uh, in networks, mostly in the United States, with this I agree absolutely with, with uh, Secretary Monitz, uh, that uh, is absolutely a need if we would like to transform the energy sector to invest more in, in, in networks and in, in distribution networks, and to invest already in, in a storage. And I think that is what we are, is going to be our contribution. And that uh, we expect with those numbers that our, our uh, profit increases, our bid increases, and the number of people which are already, we are employing, we are already uh, employing through our vendors and suppliers will increase as well. We are already uh, almost 400,000 people which are already working for us, and we, uh, we plan that this yeah. number will be increased thanks to the investment we are planning to make. But I think this is a great opportunity, 100% agree, with uh, uh, Secretary Monitz that uh, in the case of the United States, fair has to be adapted to the new technologies. I think absolutely I, I agree with him that the investment in, in energy infrastructure is key. I think it's a, limit, it's a very limited integration between the state. The level of service and distribution mm -hmm. uh, networks is, is too low compared to other countries. And it's, I think it's a great opportunity of investing uh, and transforming something which is going to be for better for the country. Okay, so thank you guys, by the way, for doing the poll so quickly, because then we can talk about it. So um, I'm going to give the results of the poll. Just remember that the question was, what's the future of oil? Uh, the majority of you say that ultimately renewables are going to replace oil by about 43%. On the flip side, you have demand coming roaring back after the pandemic at 27%. That feels like a short-term versus longer-term uh, outlook on the energy sector. And it feels like this is all well and good, talking in the United States or in Europe as a developed nation. Um, so, Josephine, this is where I think you can bring your unique perspective. Is it the same conversation in a developing nation like Africa? You know, I think that's a, an excellent point. And, and it, um, a comment that President Clinton made in a session that he had uh, sort of, I think, encapsulates what you've just said, where uh, he was talking about the development goals and said, you know, we have to agree on the end and then give people the flexibility to get there or something to that effect. And I think particularly in this space of um, renewable energy, the goals that we all have around carbon decarbonization, I think the science and the majority recognize the end goal. And I think this poll reinforces that, that ultimately we would like to see fossil fuel based um, fuels replaced by renewables. But we have to face the reality of the transition and that that will vary depending on whether in developed or developing economies. And, and sort of bringing that home from the Africa context, where you have this dual challenge of unprecedented demand, um, you know, where 600 million people today still do not have access to basic electricity, coupled with a rate of demand that's growing across sub-Saharan Africa between 3 to 6 percent. Um, you know, ensuring that we address that, um, and, and to the point raised by Secretary Moniz and Mr. Galan, investment in infrastructure. And, and for, for Sub-Saharan Africa, that's about $120 billion worth of investment just to get basic electricity access. And so the real sort of impetus, in my view, is ensuring how much of that and how we can make the majority of that be driven by renewable energy mm -hmm. and shift away from fossil fuel in a way that meets demand but also progresses us. Yeah, and Josephine, just one more quick question on that. And I wonder how you marry the two in that... Is it like cell phones, where you don't have landlines, uh, but you just let the leapfrog into cell phones? So you can just leapfrog into solar, uh, because you don't have to build the infrastructure like an oil pipe, for example. Um, or is oil going to be key for Africa? There's a lot of oil in Africa. <laughs> There's a lot of money to be made off of oil in Africa, and it's going to be cheap. Yeah, and, and you know, to that point, I think, you know, we've got to look in time periods. So I think short to medium term, and, you know, all the studies show this, the dependence on oil and gas. Um, is going to sort of 
continue to be where it is and actually grow. Um, as I said, demand is at three to six percent a year. Um, the beauty of um, you know the opportunities we have in Africa is, you know, uh, because some of the remoter areas do not have that access today. We're finding that there's a lot of um, progress and leapfrogging happening on sort of decentralized. Um, off-grid, mini-grid solutions, particularly in wind and solar, that are up upticking at about 1.2, 1.5% a year. Um, we're seeing more investment going into that. So, you know, economies in Africa, I led a national oil company. We have a lot vested in oil and gas in the short to medium term. But I think for Africa, medium to long term, as we see this population boom, the demands on infrastructure and industrialization are going mm -hmm. to require more gas. Um, so I'm hoping we sort of see a more shift towards gas, um, gas driven uh, power and energy. Um, and then, you know, in parallel to that, the, the renewable leapfrogging that we can do in terms of getting electricity to the more remote areas. So it, it will be a dual path. I think our journey will be a little longer in the oil and gas space compared to some of the developed economies. But it doesn't stop us taking those um, bigger steps on some of the renewable sides. Um, Mr. Secretary, for the poll, what would have been your answer? Uh, demand's going to come roaring back. Oil producers are doomed. Carbon capture, storage technology is going to allow the world to keep guzzling or renewables are going to replace oil? Um, Alex, if you'll permit, I want to make a comment first on, on what oh, uh, Ignacio said. Uh, jobs. Uh, the focus on jobs is so important. Uh, uh, I'll point out that uh, what we have found is that in the five years before COVID hit, the job creation in the energy sector, this is in the United States, uh, was double the pace of job creation in the economy as a whole. So as we come out of COVID, really investing in clean energy and the infrastructure is also a high leverage job creation opportunity, and we certainly need it. Uh, in fact, the develop the uh, the economic hit uh, uh, also has propagated to Africa to extend what Josephine said. Uh, it is an unfortunate fact that the regression of the economy because of COVID has actually led to more people in sub-Saharan Africa without access to electricity. They had gained it, and now they can't afford it. So we really need to focus uh, on that development issue in, in Africa uh, as well. Now, on the poll, uh, well, we have the example, of course, of uh, 2009, uh, 2010, uh, when uh, the oil demand uh, uh, rebounded very, very uh, quickly. Uh, I think here it will be a bit more slow. Uh, whether or not uh, BP is correct, that uh, we've reached peak oil or, or already or not, uh, we will see. Uh, but certainly the idea that the oil and gas companies have to uh, engage and, frankly, pick up the pace uh, on their business model evolution uh, is, is clear. Many of them are, in fact, want, they want to compete with Ignacio uh, in, in the electricity space. But also, going to your poll, uh, CCS carbon dioxide removal, low carbon liquid fuels of the future, and hydrogen, uh, I think are all examples of areas where the oil and gas companies uh, can evolve to a low carbon future using many of the, uh, the capabilities, many of the same workers uh, that they have now. So I think we have to think of this evolution to low carbon uh, as a coalition of, of, of basically all the players. The, the incumbent energy companies, the renewable companies, envi environmental groups, financial groups, labor, business, military, religious leaders. Uh, that's the hard work that we're going to have to see starting in well, the United States, certainly starting in 2021 uh, with a President Biden forging those coalitions so that we can move as fast as we can uh, in the in the decarbonization direction. Uh, Ignacio, do you guys invest a lot in carbon capture? We did already. We spent quite a lot of money in uh, in Scotland. Uh, we use already one of our existing coal power plant. We were already just making so we make a deal with Shell for using their empty wells and mm -hmm. the and the no use uh, pipes. And uh, but even though I think using these uh, let's say obsolete resources and with our power plant, it was not already uh, economical feasible. And I think after spending a huge amount of money, we decided not to go ahead with that one. Saying that, saying that, I think that your question related to the future of the oil, 
I, I'm going to say something that I was saying for the last 20 years. I think oil it needs a more novel use than just burning. So uh, oil can, it can be used for many, many things. But I think we've been using the less novel way, just burning. So which I think, I think is uh, my, my, my point on that one. And the same thing uh, what uh, my, my colleague Josephine is, was mentioning. I think uh, I've seen the, 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 uh, the third world countries, they have the great opportunity not to repeat the mistake we made, which is forcing ourselves to close almost 2,000 gigawatts in the next decade. Only a neighbor dollar never closed more than 10,000 megawatts of coal and oil. So uh, I think they can already start already building new instead of being building old and to be forced to close afterwards, as we have already been doing in most of our countries. So, Josephine, you have a great opportunity from scratch to make something already well done, more competitive, cleaner, more efficient, uh, that we, unfortunately, because we have not uh, we have not this technology available many years ago, we've been doing another thing and we've been forced to put in our balance sheet and to make already, for, to force our shareholders to pay for the mistakes, let's say mistake we did in the past. No pressure, Josephine. I don't know. Uh, it's great. No, and I, I, I completely embrace uh, Mr. Galan's enthusiasm uh, on that. I, I think we do have a fantastic opportunity. Um, and and I, as I said before, we just got to balance that with the realities of where we are. Um, but uh, to Mr. Galan's point, there's many lessons we can learn. There's many areas that we can leapfrog, particularly in the sort of decentralized electricity space. Um, we, we do still have the challenges around sort of the thermal energy needs and the deep mining and, and some of the heavier industries where I think gas will be around much longer. But even then, technology is improving. Um, but sort of coming back to a point, you know, in the excitement around jobs that, that Secretary Muniz mentioned and, and listening to the announcements today um, that, you know, Europe is taking on these big, ambitious, bold um, statements, which I think are fantastic. You know, from an African perspective, it makes me realize that, you know, for these new sort of newer producers that are coming into play in the sector who have this sort of heavy reliance on the revenues and the job opportunities we see coming from the oil and gas sector in the short to medium term, you know, if the technologies um, improve and innovation starts moving faster, we need to start preparing for a world that says maybe that timeline is not as long as we, we think it is and we need to be actually investing more in the renewable uh, space, looking at job creation, infrastructure development to ensure we don't get governments caught off guard where sort of huge projections were made around a sector that will see rapid reduction in demand just because innovation and technology is moving us faster so, and, and decisions are moving us faster than planned. So, so let me ask on that because we do have a question uh, talking about green technology and the questions are we putting, oh sorry Ignacio, I didn't hear you, go ahead. No, I, I think I think just to add on this, on this point that as well Secretary Moniz mentioned, I think the investment which is necessary to make for electrifying the economy is so huge. We have room for everybody. I think uh, I, I think it's not a question of competition between all companies and traditional electricity companies. It's a question everybody is needed. And I think yeah. it's those uh, oil companies which are moving in this direction, welcome. I, I used to say that uh, for years there has been our enemies. Now I'm very glad and very pleased that they are our, only our competitors. So that's great. So it's, we need to triple the investment in electricity if we would like already to deliver what has been already committed uh, for a, a reduction of emission and for increasing the efficiency. Welcome on that one. It's a great opportunity. And as soon they move in this direction, as Secretary Moni mentioned, it's better. So uh, what uh, are we I start, Yes, please. May, may I add to that? Less I may talk, I the better. That? Yeah, just to say that, um, uh, to reinforce what, what was just said, uh, two days ago, uh, we released a report uh, looking at the future of New England, which, of course, is not a resource, an energy resource rich area. And just to emphasize, what we found was uh, we're going to need to double the electricity load uh, by 2050. Uh, it's going to have to have substantial electrification of heating of buildings. We have a cold area here, you know, especially in Maine, uh, and the transportation. And 
Ignacio uh, uh, loves the idea that mm -hmm. we will need about 22 gigawatts in our baseline scenario of offshore wind. So this it's really going to be a, a huge build out uh, with lots and lots of opportunity. Also, if I may go back to Josephine's point, uh, I certainly want to uh, agree on the importance of some of the distributed electricity. But we have to remember as well that in sub-Saharan Africa, like everywhere, there is a major uh, urbanization push, tremendous electricity needs. And what we find in another uh, panel that I chair on energy access, on, on ending energy, energy poverty, uh, that's with the Rockefeller Foundation and the African Development Bank, what we find is actually the weak link, uh, the weakest link in the electricity supply system uh, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa is actually at the distribution level. Uh, and there we need a flexible framework to accommodate both centralized and distributed electricity to meet both the urban and the uh, more rural uh, uh, important needs. Joseph, I think, I think sec Secretary, I think Secretary, I'm very glad we're just saying about electricity distribution networks, because you remember a few years ago, one magazine was publishing that the distribution is uh, something like that spiral. So uh, it was already saying that there are no future for uh, networks, there are no future for distribution. So f thank, thank you very much for this journal because if, when the, the people who are selling their asset, we are buying the, the distribution asset and we are already invested in asset in distribution assets. I absolutely agree. The world is becoming more and more uh, uh, urban and the urban, I think, is not possible to make already such a distributed electricity. So it's good to use these distributed resources for remote areas. I think you know that we have in Brazil a program which was called uh, uh, Luz, uh, Luz para Todos, uh, electricity for everybody. And I think in some cases we were forced to make already long lines for supplying to remote areas. Now we can already provide this service in more efficient manner, more cheap manner. But saying that, saying that, I think the investment required in the reinforcing the grid, if we would like to make, as you mentioned, Secretary, cooling and heating already electrified, using pumped heating instead of boilers, and uh, already to secure already every time more and more depending of, uh, of the telecoms for our day-to-day -day work and our day-to-day -day life, we need already very reliable uh, uh, electricity supply. And yeah. the only reliability in that one is a very, very strong, very reliable grid, and for that is needed more and more investment. Josephine, that, that costs a lot of money, and I wonder, like, who's going to pay? I mean, developed nations are talking about that uh, now, and we're fighting over how much we're going to pay, and Africa has a lot worse. Yeah, and, and to, you know, that just reinforces the distribution challenge. One of the biggest issues around distribution is cost, land access, among other things. And, and I think because of that, um, if I just stay on the distribution point just briefly before I come to payment, um, we're finding because of the delay and the challenges around distribution, this decentralized approach is kind of how we can move faster. But I totally agree we need a way to, to settle the distribution issue. Um, and coming back to your point on cost, as I mentioned before, $120 billion just to, you know, get the estimates were around the $600 million. Uh, to Secretary Muniz's point, there's even more who've lost that access during COVID. That is not going to be... Um, something that the, the governments across Africa are going to be able to carry themselves, particularly in light of sort of increased debt that has arisen out of this COVID crisis. We're going to need um, the sort of international agencies. We're going to need support with regional bodies internationally. We're going to need to drive the PPP, private public partnership space, a lot more. Um, so the collective needs to come together so that, you know, we're all addressing this energy space mm -hmm. from a, from a um, financing level. So we have some questions from the audience, guys, and I just want to get to them. Um, one of them uh, is that are we placing too much faith in the promise of green technology? And Ignacio, you, you mentioned that you're working on sort of a decarbonization of, of the coal plants, but it is quite expensive. And if you depend on that kind of technology, does it take away the urgency for something like a carbon tax, which is actively being debated in Europe and the U.S.? Ignacio, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, I, I, I think... Uh, 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 I'm convinced that the best way of uh, reducing emission is electrifying the economy. But not all, all things can be electrified. So I think is there are quite a lot of things which can be electrified, another, uh, another can. So uh, I, I think cooling and heating, uh, 
uh, electric vehicles is easy to be electrified. But I think there are certain uh, industrial processes of the heavy transport, which is very difficult. Secretary Moniz mentioned before hydrogen. So hydrogen is already a good alternative for many things. Uh, hydrogen can be used already, not only for, uh, 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 as it was already comment in the, in the past, for, for certain uses, but can be used for certain industrial processes. We just announced a few days ago a project of one, almost $2 billion investment for, a, for a, a producing green hydrogen for the largest, uh, uh, almost all the European a fertilizer company for producing their ammonia. So I think the, the hydrogen of the ammonia now is already produced with a, a process which is called steam reform, which is using natural gas as a, a raw material. Mm -hmm. So we can already make that one with electrolysis. And we have already made the plan, a great agreement with Fertiveria for making that happen. So that gave already that same thing can be done for certain heavy transport, for uh, vessels, or for trains in the areas where the railway is not electrified. So, and, and same thing, we can already be used for another industrial processes, which I know they are working on that one, which is, for instance, the uh, production of steel for using a, a hydrogen instead of coal for reduction of the oxide. So, there are areas with the steel using electricity coming from renewable resources, uh, uh, re renewable sources, can already diminish drastically the level of emission with allow ourselves not to be forced to continue burning fossil fuels and to look for alternative of the storage. I think, in my opinion, excuse me to be so straightforward, the problem is not solved at the ground in the problem. The problem has to be solved. The problem is not solved putting the problem under the ground. So, and, and that is more cardboard sequestration. I know that there are other process, chemical process, which are the way for solving this thing. But I think what we work, and that was our, our, our analysis, what we try to make in Scotland was to take the problem, the, co the, the carbon emission, and to mm -hmm. put underground. Yeah. So, which I think in 20, 150 years, the problem remained there. So, so if they find out solution, chemical solution, for so already- So, Ignacio, uh, does that mean that you don't need a carbon tax? Sorry? Does that mean that you don't need a carbon tax? Well, I, I think the carbon tax, I think it's a good way for switching. The carbon tax or what we are in, with in Europe, the ETS, the emission trading scheme. So that's good for helping to switch from one technology to another one in, in order that, uh, that when we have to take a, 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 a decision, so a, a financial decision, an investment decision, we have to make a choice if it's better to pay so variable cost for the, for the carbon or it's better to make investment which uh, we will uh, we, uh, we will avoid this this carbon right. emission. So that's good. I think in Europe is working. I think is is helping to reduction of emission in a very important manner. So mm -hmm. uh, all of the industry, uh, European industry, has not been heavily affected because of this carbon uh, uh, cost. There are certain sectors which are already giving certain allowance in the in the in the in the initial initial time to the moment the technology is already updated. But I think it works. I yeah. think the best thing for taking a decision is to put the price. If you put the price, you take the decision in one direction or the one, you're free to, de to decide what is the best way for you. Um, could, I, could I just add, could I, could I just uh, reinforce, uh, I think a very important point that Ignacio brought forward, uh, and that is that while uh, we all expect uh, significant electrification, but as he said, I'll just rephrase it, uh, I, be I believe we will also need some form of fuel. Uh, now, that fuel could be hydrogen. Uh, that's, that's what I'm most bullish on. Uh, there could be other alternatives. But fundamentally, some form of fuel uh, which can serve uh, as a, story, a, lo a long duration storage medium. It can have the, uh, the applications across many sectors, like natural gas does today, it's kind of a natural, natural uh, evolution. So I think that's that's very very important. But secondly, uh, and this may be more controversial, uh, although I think it's kind of straightforward, is uh, I believe net zero and eventually net negative uh, are, are the right goals. But I think to get there, we have to face up to the issue of negative carbon technologies, carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere through multiple channels. Uh, is going to be essential. 
we're not going to drive the emissions all the way to zero. Mm -hmm. We've got to get close. Uh, and then I think take the carbon dioxide uh, out of the atmosphere, perhaps out of the upper oceans, uh, in order to uh, get to net zero and eventually net negative. So it's pretty broad. On the carbon tax, carbon pricing, uh, I think in the, in, the, in the long term, directly or indirectly, we will have to price uh, uh, carbon, especially to move not the electricity sector so much, but to move those hard to decarbonize sectors like industry, uh, for example, uh, like uh, agriculture, it's not carbon, but, but other greenhouse gases, uh, we will need, I think, a, frankly, substantial carbon price to move those sectors also uh, to, the net, to the net zero direction. So we have a question um, also that I want to highlight here, and it kind of dovetails with what you're talking about. It says, are you concerned that gas is becoming the new coal? Gas has been a transition fuel for a couple decades now. How long do we expect the transition to be? And somewhere along the line, I'll add, is gas got caught up in the dirty story in some capacity, particularly as it related to fracking. Um, Mr. Secretary, I just wanted to get your take on that. Um, and Josephine, maybe you can comment after. Well, uh, I think you've said it in, in, in effect well. Uh, if I ask the question, is gas part of the problem or part of the solution, the answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> in, the United, in, the United, in the United States, uh, it has been, uh, by, uh, uh, by displacing coal, it has been the biggest contributor uh, to uh, carbon emissions reductions. However, as we go forward and get to lower carbon, then the emissions uh, clearly uh, become too high. Uh, the way I see it is what we will see is the need, and this came out in our New England study that I mentioned earlier, we will see the need to maintain substantial gas capacity, even though the usage will be getting lower and lower. Uh, uh, it's there as part of the, if in effect, the backup system. Like, for example, electrifying heating is great. Uh, uh, and Ignacio mentioned, uh, let's say, air sourced heat pumps. Uh, but when you get that polar vortex uh, in New England, um, we're probably mm -hmm. going to need to, to bring in the cavalry. Uh, but at the same time, I think we can be developing, for example, that hydrogen infrastructure transition, already you are seeing uh, GE and Mitsubishi and Siemens uh, putting out into the market turbines that can go up to 30 percent hydrogen and eventually 100 percent hydrogen on the electricity side. Ignacio mentioned hydrogen can be used in the steel production. Uh, so uh, it can be used in transportation, especially in, in, in heavier heavier vehicles. So um, so I think there's a, there's a there's a transition that we can see here going from where we are today, where we have done some carbon reduction, but we're getting behind the eight ball, that's for sure, uh, uh, all the way to net zero uh, by, by mid-century. Absolutely, I agree, this? absolutely, you are saying. It, Sorry. Ignacio, hold on. I just want to get uh, Josephine to respond to that really quickly, and then I have another question from yeah. the viewer on nuclear. So, Josephine, go ahead. No, I mean, in terms of the gas narrative, uh, I, I agree with with you know many of the points that Secretary um, Moniz has, has mentioned, but in terms of the gas narrative, particularly developing economies like like Africa, as I mentioned, the demand and growth projections that we have, where by 2050 we'll be at 2.4 billion um, as a population, that that sort of time period will will require huge levels of infrastructure and industrialization. That in the sort of medium to, to long term, I believe natural gas will be. Uh, will play a significant role equally to a, to a point that Mr. Galan mentioned, electricity doesn't solve everything. And when it comes to sort of um, uh, fuels for cooking and, and heat, um, we see that there's still heavy reliance on forestry in Africa, where our forestry, our deforestation rates are double most of the world. So natural gas plays a huge role in, in offsetting that, that, that issue um, in the medium to sort of long term um, for domestic use. There's you know, new finds happening across various parts of Western, Southern, uh, sort of Eastern Africa. So I think natural gas will have a longer trajectory in Africa. Ultimately, you know, we all have the aspirations of renewable sources, but it definitely has a, a longer term play in places like Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so I, I think I, that's extremely, extremely important. And I would just add on the cooking issue, it's an enormous health problem, especially for women and yeah. children. Uh, and frankly, 
until we get away from this need for uh, biomass gathering, uh, we will not have sufficient women in parliament in Africa. That's interesting. Uh, Ignacio, you wanted to add to that? Well, I, I think globally, I, I agree with uh, what has been said. I think it's uh, a natural, uh, 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 natural gas will play a key role in the transition. But uh, uh, and I think that in, in, certain, in certain uses, like power generation, as, as Ali said by Ernest, uh, is uh, going to move from base load technology to backup technology. I think the base load is better to, to produce with gas than with coal, certain, that is helping to emission reduction, no doubt. And, uh, and I think we can already ratify that that is precisely what is happening in countries and we are already renewables and we have already got fire power plants. I think that our, our gas fire power plants were designed for working 5,000, 6,000 hours per annum. In this moment, they are already working 1,000, 1,500. But without this power plant, we can put and risk the system. So I think mm -hmm. that is needed for the system for more from keeping the power than for an, a, energy itself. But I think they are needed and it's going to be needed for a long time uh, uh, still up to the moment we have already the whole system, renewable, storage, et cetera, et cetera, in a proper manner. So I think I, I see the natural gas still has a long, a, 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 play, a, a key play to, an important a role to play yeah. In the, in the future as well. So we only have two minutes, so we need to keep the answer short. But I'm curious as to, like, over the next 12 months, we've talked about so many things in the last 40 minutes. What's, like, the one thing that you're really keying in on, focusing on, uh, anticipating in the next 12 months? Um, Mr. Secretary, can I start with you? You guys have, like, 30 seconds apiece because I don't want to go too long. Well, again, I, I think the, uh, uh, the, the big story should be, in the, in the United States at least, uh, although I think really globally, this has to be a decade of supercharged innovation. And by innovation, I mean all the way through to deployment. Uh, if we don't really pick up the pace dramatically, develop the new tools that can scale starting around 2030, uh, it's going to be very, very hard uh, to meet. Now, that innovation agenda will include lots and lots of things. Uh, I think you mentioned uh, briefly, like advanced nuclear fission and fusion mm -hmm. with, new, with new technologies. Uh, CCS, uh, carbon dioxide removal, low carbon fuels, hydrogen, uh, resolving the supply chain issue for critical mineral, minerals and metals, mm -hmm. uh, long duration storage. It's a big, big portfolio. Uh, and we need to up our uh, game by factors of two and three, not by 10%. Josephine, what about you? Uh, uh, data. As a data scientist, data is, is king for me. And I think um, the more we gather around data, I, I'm working with a company now that we're pulling multiple satellite and land data so that we get sort of really good agro ecosystem modeling and data reasoning on land use. It's really proprietary. It's really innovative to the Secretary's point on innovation. And it's targeted at land stewards investors, corporates, governments. So everyone has a sort of common pool of data to make really strategic decisions to get us to the common yeah. goal. Uh, Ignacio, you got like 10 seconds. Make it tight. One thing. Uh, well, limiting the impact of the COVID and uh, do the, everything to put in our hands to contribute to an effective econo economy recovery and continue decreasing emission to fight climate change. And for that, we have already approved a plan of $90 billion in the next five years to help in to this economy yeah. recovery and this fighting against climatic change. Uh, guys, it was so great to talk to you. Um, I feel like we dissected a lot here. Mr. Secretary Ignacio and Josephine, thank you very much.